Hello everyone and welcome back. As promised, I told you I was gonna get this surgery thing out and it's been over a month. So this is a fun one. This is where I saw her about a year and a half ago. Ended up doing root canals on both 10 and 12 and that thing just kept growing larger and larger. So at this point you kind of expect it's a cyst. You can see she's already have a fair amount of recession, unfortunately. Um, thick biotype, but kind of a weird pattern of recession. And you'll see there's gonna be some significant bone loss on this. Uh, this is one where I ended up having to send her to a periodontist after we saw her back because a little concerned about her healing here. So because of that, I decided to do a papillary sparing incision rather than a attached gingival incision uh, like I normally do just because of the lack of pocket depth there and the lack of, lack of attached gingiva. So ideally the periodontist will be able to do some grafting, get this, uh, you know, get that area covered where the root surface is exposed. But I wanted to try to limit the amount of recession and I found this is the second best way to do it after the you know attached gingival incision. Um, go ahead and do the vertical here. Ended up going right by the frenum. Her attachment wasn't too high, so I didn't worry about doing a frenuloplasty or anything like that. Um, going down and starting to raise up the flap here with the periosteal elevator. So as you can see, as soon as we uncover around that canine, there is no bone along the entire facial surface. So that made me, and that's the uneasy feeling in my pit of my stomach. I was already planning on grafting this case. I don't normally normally graft my surgery cases, but in this one, the comb beam will show that, or I actually forgot to put the comb beam in here. Maybe I'll add that in after. <laughs> um, the comb beam will show that the uh, amount of the defect went all the way through to the palatal tissue. And so when that happens, you worry about invasion of the soft tissue and just incomplete healing. So this is one where I did talk with her beforehand and we did talk about the pros and cons and elected to go ahead and do a grafting procedure, which I'll show you here in about 10 minutes or so. Um, go ahead and keep laying that flap. And as you can see that bone loss there, just not feeling too happy about all that. The infection was also up pretty high. Um, you, comparing the first and last PAs, you can see it, it definitely Definitely grew over that time even with all the work we were doing and 10 and 12 were dead they did need root canals that's that wasn't uh wasn't the source of it but just how this kind of just all congealed together that's what always made me concerned so that's what it looks like and you can see um kind of that uh loveliness as we start to get inside there and start to remove the cyst the lesion that's kind of stuck in there so i'm trying to be as conservative as possible when it comes to removing the root tips here but i do especially if i'm going to be grafting i feel okay opening up a larger hole in the bone to conserve more tooth structure the bone will heal back up especially if you're doing a graft so i'm not as concerned about it so if you've been struggling with your apicos i mean you know if you've watched this channel i am very very keen on minimally invasive endodontics being the way of the future but uh, with surgery you can make a bigger hole in the bone it's going to come back that's the nice news there and you can see how that infection had kind of gone between the roots of tenon 11 here. I kept looking back at 12 and wasn't ever able to see anything come in there, so I decided to just do the Apico on 10 and 11. Once again, increasing the size of the access here just because the bone's going to grow back and it's more important for me to save root tissue here than it is to save a little bit of buckle bone. So, um, as you can see, this is this is what I cut out about five minutes of me playing around trying to get this cyst out of here. <laughs> so, but we're gonna go in and start removing the tip of the root here. I love this Blade Sonic from Helsey Ultrasonics. Um, this thing is just amazing. Uh, crank it up to 100% and it just cuts through it like butter. The number 10 was very, very easy. You'll see in a second here, I actually had to speed up the number 11 because it just takes forever to cut through this thing. So this is at about three times speed. Um, there it goes, that's where it speeds up. <laughs> um, and you can see, I like to use almost a sawing motion here they have a new one that has serrations on the end of it so i did just order that hopefully i'll be using that here in a surgery you know coming coming to you soon but i ended up removing about three four millimeters on that one um it, it the root was long enough i wasn't too too worried about it but you can see that lovely gush of blood there because we at this point have now hit the palatal tissue um so the I tend to not give palatal injections initially when I do my surgeries unless I know that I'm going to need to. And in her case, I was trying to see if I could get away with it. But you'll see in a second, she does start to kind of wiggle a bit because she was feeling it. All my patients are sedated for surgeries, so I'm not too, too concerned about it. But um, right there is where she starts feeling a little bit. So we're going to come in here with some anesthesia. I just like using the 1 to 50 Lido. It's going to get the tissue numb and it's going to 
help with bleeding. You don't normally want to inject with that on the palatal because if you're injecting into that and it's against bone, you can have necrosis because of the vasoconstriction. In this case though, there is no bone against that area and so it's very easy to get that to, you can see it's still bleeding. <laughs> so I'm not worried about too much vasoconstriction. Try to use the longer tip here, but unfortunately I had to go with a shorter one. Um, it's kind of a, I think it's Siobhan Friedman who talked way back at our, oh gosh, this was 10 years ago to my residency class and talked about how it is beneficial to remake, you know, move, remove more in your retro prep if possible. Um, but in this case, I didn't want to remove any more. We were cl close enough to her nose as it was, so no need to remove more bone. So go ahead and just use my BNL, um, same ones you've seen in the past. Do that three millimeter retro prep. Um, yeah, this is pretty standard here. I did just order some new surgery ultrasonics also from Helsi that are a little bit shorter. So um, see those coming up here. I'm always changing which ultrasonics I use because there's so many different companies and there's you can never have enough pretty much. <laughs> so I, I this is one area where I do probably buy more ultrasonic tips than I need. Um, but that's kind of what it looks like at this point. We I took an x-ray and now count. it's time to count. One, and <laughs> unfortunately two, went through a few here. Three, yep. four, yep. A few moments later. Nine! <laughs> so we didn't actually make it to nine. <laughs> we ended up having eight total, but I couldn't find the count saying eight, so I figured this would be the best way to, uh, you know, hopefully make you guys giggle a little bit. But that is the BC Putty as normal. This is a different assistant than my normal one who's um, working here, and so I was trying to get her to make it more of a cone. These are a little too flat for what I would like. So in general, try to go more cone shape when you're doing this part. Um, but be gentle here when compacting down as well. This material likes to kind of, I think sploosh is the best verb for it, out the sides. So you don't want to push too, too hard. You can see it kind of moving on me there. So as you get towards the, uh, let's say the most apical portion, um, or a, I don't know, would this be coronal if it slipped around? When you get to be close to being done, you just wanna be really gentle with your compaction here. And you can see um, that I'm being a little bit softer here, but that's kind of how the retro prep works. I absolutely love this stuff. I used MTA for years, but this BC Putty is just fantastic. Once again, not sponsored by Brassler, but uh, if they'd like to sponsor me, I would gladly take their money and their free products. <laughs> um, I ended up using more of their things I think than anybody else. But you can see here how I'm being a little bit more gentle with the compaction. And that's just because if you push too hard, it's all going to come out the end of the tooth and that's not really what you want to have happen so um yeah it's kind of just going through here making sure it looks good and you do want to try to keep a, the stuff on the outside of the root as minimal as possible so you'll see the x-ray here in just a minute um and then I like to take a dry cotton pellet and almost like you're finishing up an amalgam, just burnish it with a dry cotton pellet to make sure that it looks good. And here we go for the x-ray. So there is a little bit around the outside of the tooth that I do need to get off. I'll show you how to do that in a second, but let's go ahead and pull those bad boys out. If you're counting, we're at three and four and five. And this is the most bracelets I've ever put inside a, a crypt uh, just because it was so stinking large here. Um, but I like to use a scaler. So this is just an R34. You can throw that in your kit um, or pick your you know favorite scaler, but it works really well to get that excess um, BC material. That right there is why we have to graft. That is the palatal tissue. So what do we use for grafting? I'm going to use the stuff that the oral surgeon uses. <laughs> so this is a 50-50 corticocancellous mix. I do not stay up on all the grafting techniques because I don't do any implants. However, I trust that Chris does, which is nice. Um, one thing that happens is this stuff does, the bone material does actually expire after time and it is incredibly expensive. So what I did, if you ever end up working or if you're near an oral surgeon, and you plan on doing, or a periodontist who does implants, or even a general dentist that does implants, if they're gonna be going through the stuff, what I did with Chris is I actually bought a pack of like five, and over the course of, well, it's, I've been open for three years now at this location, this is my finally getting through the fifth one. And so that way he, he has all of them and he'll use it all up, and that way none of it expires. So it's kind of a nice way, if you're not doing a ton of surgeries and not doing a lot of grafting, you can still have it available to you and not have to worry about it you know, expiring. So one thing I did do here was try Try and cover that root surface as much as possible. I know without using a membrane, it's probably not going to hold there, but it's going to be better than if I didn't. And I had excess, as you can see. I used a full CC for this just because the size was so large. And at this point, we're going to go ahead and get the suturing done. So when suturing this, it's not nearly as easy as the attached gingival flap. And so a lot of this, this 
took almost 15 minutes to do these sutures. So I sped up a lot of it here. You'll see it starts to get a little frantic looking. So it is sped up to about three times just so you're not sitting here forever. But I wanted to try to get this tissue to stay in place as best as possible. So I did a lot more singles rather than running locking like I would on the vertical. It's a normal running locking, just like you've seen me do a, you know, a ton of times and that's totally fine. But on along that horizontal cut, right where the papillary spare, the, you know, right where the papilla are, um, I want to try to get this to hold as tightly as possible just because she already had recession in here. Nice young gal. Unfortunately, she just has kind of some perio, which is very strange. Her teeth are clean and she's got um, you know, really nice thick gingival. So I'm not sure why she had so much recession to begin with, but I want to try to minimize the risk of that for her. So um, the vertical is pretty straightforward. You guys have seen this a hundred times, but when we go in to do the horizontal, that's where things kind of get interesting here. One thing I did do is try to keep that vertical um, kind of close-ish to where the frenum was. She doesn't have a very active frenum, so I'm not too, too worried about it. But I found that if you're right on top of it and almost involve the frenum in the suturing, it can't move as much as kind of seems to be what the case is. So you run a less risk of it, you know, ripping everything out of there. So um, vertical, like I said, it's pretty boring. That's a, that's a normal one, but you'll see here in a second how we do the horizontal and that's where things kind of get interesting. So I started um, actually at the distal aspect because I wasn't as concerned there. You can see the recession really isn't that bad between 12 and 13. I mean, 13 is obviously pretty bad, but 12 doesn't look bad at all. So that's an easy, just single. I think I may have done one or two here. Once again, we, I do these all live while watching it. So I'm watching it with you for the first time as well. Um, if, you're, if you made it this far, uh, please hit a like button or a comment or something just so I know that people actually stick around this long. Uh, it does take a while to edit these, and if no one cares about the sutures, uh, I'll just leave them out next time. But if you do care about this, I will I will gladly keep it in. I, once again, I do this for you guys and for the residents and want to try to help uh, the endo community become the best as it can be and learn together. So um, at this point, I did move back to the mesial here. I kind of, when you have a papillary sparing and a incision like this, it seems to be better if you kind of bounce around rather than doing them all in a row because you want to make sure that the flap stays in place, the loose part of the flap. So I did two here between nine and 10 just for strength and stability to hold that in place. And then here's where it gets real fun because that canine, you lost all the bone there and I really need this to stay in place. So taking very deep bites, as you can see, um, I, the, the aesthetic issue isn't going to be scarring of the gingival tissue, it's going to be recession. So we've already gained a little bit of attachment, but unfortunately, it's a, I don't have a photo of the post-op, but we did see her a few weeks after, and unfortunately, she did have some recession in this area. So I did send her over to Perio. Um, interested to see what they end up doing. I'll, I'll update you guys if I ever hear back from the periodontist. Um, but just singles right now just to hold this in place and then i think yeah we cut these and then what i'm going to do is almost do like a mattress suture involving the palatal tissue so what i'm doing here is grabbing the flap and getting it around the tooth and then wrapping it around the palatal and this is a very 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 strong suture and that's why i'm doing it here because i do not want this flap to fall down at all and go ahead and grab on to that loose portion just to make sure we get as much almost bunching up as possible in this area i mean yes it would be better if we could just graft it from the beginning but i don't really ever do that but this is a way that you can kind of get some coronal guidance on that and get it to look a little bit better so you can see we've actually kind of improved the smile on where it was before and then for the x-ray i'm very pleased with it i love doing these grafting cases because they always look amazing on the x-ray anyway i promised everybody i would show that one so once again thank you all for watching um if you have any questions comments please drop them below and let me know if there's anything else you'd like to see otherwise i thank you again for watching and i will talk to you next time